You know, it's so hard because it's, it's a story about yarns, right? About tall tails. So it's hard to kind of tracing back. I've got so many yarns, kind of a big ball of yarn. I had this idea to do this mega project on Sudbury. I wanted to bring in really the labor crisis and the history of it. And I quickly realized that was way too heavy a uh, topic to start off with. And my understanding of the city wasn't deep enough to really tackle that. Instead, I was reading this book on sports called Homegrown Heroes, much lighter stuff you'd think. And I found this little anecdote about Bert Flynn, who was called the most famous figure in the Nickel Belt Baseball League. Small guy who came from down south and who wasn't allowed to play in the leagues down there because they thought he, he looked like a bat boy and not a player. He got a job in the mines and started playing for the Copper Cliff Redmen team. And from then on, for the next like 30 years, he was a fixture in the league. He went from playing to managing. He played every position on the field. Uh, he was the best every year, apparently, at, in all statistical categories. And I just thought, wow, nobody knows who this guy is. But at one time, for a very short window, probably everybody in the city knew who he was. And it just was a really interesting story about how stories are misform and then are completely dis disappear and are lost, you know, and forgotten. I started to use research as a synonym for procrastination, you know, it's just I, I kind of need to vibrate with research to the point where I'm going to blow up and i just like, I need to write this now. This one was really fascinating. It started out with the easy stuff, which is book research. But then we put out a call with, with STC looking for people in the community who might have had family members or who might even be alive who had played in the league to kind of share stories, mm -hmm. to share their experience at the time. I was really nervous because sometimes you put something like that out and nobody answers it. And that's the way it was for about a week. And I was like, oh. And then I got a call from this guy named Warren Maxwell, who was about 85, had, uh, had played in the league for one year in 51 and won like, they won the championship that year. And he had this perfect story. I went over to his house and he invited me in. We had tea and, and from then on, he just kind of launched me. He's like, call these people. And then people just started to call me. And I, I think I went to about at least eight or nine different houses and, you know, broke bread, as it was cookies with people. It was my dream to sit and listen to people tell me baseball stories. Like that, that, it's like I didn't have a grandpa that did that. So this was like my grandpa and grandma's having me into their houses and be like, here's some amazing treasures. So I really tried to fold all those experiences back into the play because in some ways it's, it's like a gift back to the community without being quaint, I hope, or a back padding. There's a lot of community work, and this goes back to the 70s when Regional work was really important in Canada, in Canadian theatres. Most of those stories are celebrations of community. They're ways of saying like, look at us, aren't we great, you know? I really didn't want to do that. And I think that's what interests me about this community. There's a lot of shame here about this kind of dirty mining past. At the same time, there's, a, there's this new movement that seems to really take pride in that shame, that we're proud of all the burnt rock and sooty buildings and our bush parties, you know? That what really interests me, I guess, is is why we choose to stay here. Because most of my friends growing up couldn't wait to get out. And I always thought I would just stay here. You know, I knew I, I, it was just kind of a given that I loved my home. And so that's what all this work really, I think, selfishly is about, is trying to figure out why I'm, why I'm here. And it's not that I'm stuck here, it's that I want to be here. This isn't a celebration to me about how wonderful Sudbury is. There's a lot of dark feelings in here about the way we've treated each other and the way we've treated our city. So this is something that I'm afraid to share, and I think that's why it's big to share it here, is because there, there might be people that see it that aren't comfortable necessarily and do not agree with certain perspectives in it. It's a play about mucking. It's a play about fumbling around in the dark and trying to find something. It's an unearthing of things that we're afraid to share, but hopefully in that unearthing we'll at least start a conversation about it, specifically about how we treat our myths and how we treat our past here. My concern is the words, right? And it being a, a new piece, I've continued to tinker and work. Tinker's an underwhelming... I've been trying to rip apart and put back the script based on the discoveries they've been making in that room. And that's what's most important to me, is to give those guys and gals the best possible words that I can give them. So the production side of it doesn't make me nervous because they're tremendously equipped and talented to deal with the bad stuff I give them. This is their show now, it's not mine. So it's Lee's, it's Daniel's, it's Scott and Laura and, and Charlene, and it's not really not anything for me to be nervous about. I get to just witness great work and then cringe at bad words, you know? Baseball to me is, is a game of stories. Hockey's, you know, it's got in-between periods and, and basketball's got quarters. But it's a rush, right? Like that's gotta go to the bathroom, gotta get my drink, gotta sit down. 
there's a little bit of analysis and you're into it. Whereas baseball is slowly paced all throughout. A lot of empty air that you have to fill with the ghosts of the game. That's what I think is beautiful about baseball. It's a storyteller sport. And you're able to create stories out of truth. The truth becomes larger than life. The players become 10 feet tall. I mean, baseball at a time was big everywhere in North America. It was the sport. And the advent of television is mostly what these guys pointed to as killing the league. People heard about Babe Ruth. They read about him in the box scores. But if you don't see him play, he's nowhere near as good as Burt Flynn, who you go down to the field to see every week. But the minute they start seeing these guys on television, it became, why, why should I walk down to the field when I can watch the world's best teams right here in my living room? And I just think that we've always thought about ourselves as this rough, rugged, you know, we're a wintry place, so hockey's natural here. It's very stereotypical. Oh, sounds like a parallel of the theater, you know? <laughs> yeah. You come to the theater Sa where you can sadly watch enough. a movie on your phone. Movies are like hockey. <laughs> You know, I see out on the billboard and around that's like a Sudbury story or a baseball story about Sudbury or a Sudbury story. And, and it makes me cringe a bit because, again, that wasn't my intention. It was to create a Sudbury story. It was to create a story about this man who's trying to find out if his life has any value. And I think it's a struggle that a lot of people, you know, I feel like my life has very little value and I make very little impact on a daily basis. I, when I, I will live in the past, I think that's probably why. But my past is, is the 1980s, really. And when I walk down uh, the streets, I can literally sometimes see like the ghost of a building overlaid over what's there, you know? And I, just this image of, of the downtown like an old dog. And I've always been obsessed with those buildings have been spray stuccoed. And what if this dog just shook off all that stucco? What would we see underneath? So I think that's my obsession with the, the past is always tied to the present. It's the discomfort I feel with the now. And so I write about the past because it's a way of really commenting on the present without slapping people in the face. I'm also very interested in the future, but I do, I do have the perception that it's a darker place than, uh, than what's come before. Anything that I write is usually a grotesque exaggeration of something that I'm going through or that, that's bothering me. You know, if I could lay out my life on a map and see from years one to years 32, would it make sense to me? Would I be able to pick out year 15 and say, that's why I ended up being really sad here at 31. Or here was the most perfect moment of my life. And I remember this so clearly, being like 15 or 16 and thinking, this is as good as it gets. Like, I am so happy right now that life will never be better than this. And I remember feeling this intense sadness right after that. But it really made me enjoy the moment. And then just recently, about three weeks ago, I had that thought again. I was like, no, this is the best part of my life right now. I want to start enjoying this because I've never been happier than this right now. You know, it's so easy to let years slip by to figure out if you're really acting in the best interest of, of yourself and those around you in every single day. Is there anything else that you want to that you want to say that you want to add that you feel I haven't touched on that you'd like the world to know? <laughs> <laughs> the, the very small world. Tell me anything. Uh, well, I do like long walks on the beach. <laughs>